Our first speaker tonight uh, for the Ogden Surgical Medical Society faculty keynote speech is Amy Herman. Amy Herman is a lawyer and an art historian. She works, uh, yeah, she, uses, um, <clears throat> she uses the works of art to sharpen observation, analysis, and communication skills. By showing people how to look closely at paintings, sculptures, and photography, she helps them hone their visual intelligence to recognize the most pertinent and useful information, as well as recognize biases that impede decision making. She developed her Art of Perception seminar in 2000 to improve medical students' observations and communication skills with their patients when she was the head of education at the Frick Collection in New York City. She subsequently adapted the program for a wide range of professionals and leads sessions internationally for the New York City Police Department, the FBI, the French National Police, the Department of Defense, Interpol, the State Department, various Fortune 500 companies, first responders, retailers, and the military. In her highly participatory presentations, she demonstrates the necessity for astute visual literacy and how the analysis of works of art affords participants an innovative way to refresh their sense of critical inquiry and skills necessary for sharper performance and effective leadership. The program has been featured in the New York Times, the Wall Street Journal, CBS Evening News, Smithsonian Magazine, amongst others. Her TED Talk, A Lesson on Looking, went live in December 2018. Ms. Herman holds an AB, a JD, and an MA in art history. Her, her book, Visual Intelligence, Sharpen Your Perception, Change Your Life, was published in May 2016 and was on the New York Times and Washington Post bestseller list. Her second book, Fixed, How to Perfect the Fine Art of Problem Solving was published in December 2021. We want to please welcome everyone, our Ogden Surgical Medical Society faculty keynote speaker, Amy Herman. I got one of the last international flights from Rome. Who goes to Italy as the pandemic is breaking out? I got a last flight in from Rome. I was working for NATO, and when I got back to New York, everything shut down, hard stop. I had to cancel 20 flights in March of 2020, and 23 flights in April of 2020. And I was locked down in my 850 square foot apartment in New York City. And you know what happens when you start working remotely in an 850 square foot apartment? You open your eyes one morning and you say, what day is it? Because everything is the same, all the days are the same. And I realized very quickly that this was not a sustainable situation. And every morning that I got up, the day looked like these blocks, these randomly scattered blocks. And every day I had to pull it together for my family, my relationships, my stakeholders, my work, my clients, my business. And what I loved about Kumi Yamashita's work is she looked at the blocks, not just for the properties of the blocks themselves, but she thought about the shadows that they would cast collectively. And she put these seemingly random blocks on a wall, and she shone a single light through them. And by thinking about the shadows that the blocks would collectively cast, that's what created that perfect silhouette. This is not apparent when you look at the work of art this way. But she used what I call visual intelligence, meaning to see what other people don't. And so tonight, we're going to be talking about that concept of visual intelligence. How do we see what other people don't? But the title of the presentation tonight is Getting to Fixed New Lenses for Problem Solving. Because let me guess, nothing's broken, right? After two years, what we've been through, nothing is broken. So what I want to do is try to be that light tonight, to bring order to some chaos to think about how we can look at existing resources differently and how we might be able to look at our problems through new lenses to find more innovative and more sustainable solutions. So I thought it was appropriate while you were eating to show you some pot roast. So the reason I'm showing you the pot roast, some of you may be familiar with this tale, but a young couple got married, newly married, and the husband wanted to make his family's famous pot roast for his new wife. So he cooks the pot roast, and they sit down to dinner, 
and she tastes it. And he says, what do you think of the pot roast? She said, it's wonderful, sweetheart. It's really delicious. But I have a question. Why'd you cut the ends off the pot roast? And the husband said, well, gee, I don't know. That's the way my mother always made the pot roast. So that night, they finish up dinner. And he called his mother, and he said, Mom, I made the family pot roast tonight. And my wife wants to know, why did we cut the ends off the pot roast? And the mother laughed. She said, because that's the way your grandmother made it. So he hung up, he thanked his mother, he hung up the phone, and he called Grandma, and he said, Grandma, I made the family pot roast tonight. I have a question. Why did you cut the ends off the pot roast? And she said, and she laughed, and she said, because that was the only way it would fit into my pot. So, you know, what's the takeaway here? Just because we've been doing something a certain way doesn't mean that we have to keep doing it. We have to constantly think about why we're doing things. And one of the takeaways from this evening's presentation is to refresh your sense of critical inquiry and think about how you ask questions to elicit the information that you need to do your job. Now, I'm going to put you to work now, and I'm going to throw you into the deep end of the pool, and I'm going to ask you to introduce yourself to the person next to you at the table. And what you're going to do is you're going to need a partner for this evening. If you are three at the table, you can be a trio, but find your partner right now. Everybody now know their table mates. All right, so this is what we're going to do. You may remember from last time, I throw you into the deep end of the pool, and you get used to the water. It's a little bit kind of cold, but you'll get used to it. One of you in the partnership, or one of you in the trio, is going to keep your eyes open, and your partner or partners is going, are going to close their eyes for 45 seconds. And in those 45 seconds, I'm going to take the pot roast down, and I'm going to put up a work of art. And you're going to have 45 seconds to describe to your partner what it is that you see in the picture. OK? Now, a couple things about this. Couple, a couple of things. Number one, I, I'm just giving you this as a hint. Saying to your partner, oh, this is weird, doesn't help them. OK? Telling them that you think the picture is weird doesn't give them a good visual description, because the goal of the exercise is to think about how you communicate what you see. And the other hint I'm going to give you is before you open your mouth to give your partner the first description, just look. OK? Just look at the work of art, formulate a few words and a few thoughts, and then start talking. Decide who's going to close their eyes. And if you're a, a trio, one open, two closed. All right, ready? I realize the arithmetic is difficult. Three and two, or two and three. If you are a trio, one person's eyes are open, two are closed. And if you are a partner of two, one open, one closed. Half the room, shut your eyes. OK? All right, describers, you have 45 seconds to describe the following slide. Ready, go ahead.
ahead, open your eyes, open your eyes. That was 45 seconds. Take a look. Did you do okay? Here's the key. <laughs> Here's the key to this exercise. I don't know how many of you recognized it right away. You were looking at six boxes of frozen food with the labels taken off. Okay, so it was six boxes of frozen food. And out of curiosity, how many of you said the word asparagus? Raise your hand, all right. How many of you said lima beans? Good. How many of you said raspberries? Good. How many of you said blueberries? Okay, who said corn? And who got the elusive cantaloupe pieces? Anybody get that? Ah, there you go. Now you may be thinking, who cares? <laughs> you got, he got the cantaloupe, very good, very good. What you were doing is looking at a very, you were looking at six ordinary boxes of frozen food and they're stacked artfully in this very colorful photograph. So tonight is about looking at ordinary things and seeing extraordinary attributes. How do you look at things out of context? How many of you get down to brass tacks and talk about the actual vegetables themselves? It's an actual photograph by Irving Penn. Probably not too many people said that. Now I want you to switch places, the describer becomes the listener. Nobody escapes. All right, you ready? The other half of the room, shut your eyes. 45 seconds, and again, just take two to five seconds to just look at the screen before you say anything. Ready, 45 seconds, sync my watch. Ready, go ahead. All right, open your eyes, take a look. A little bit more complicated than six boxes of frozen fruit and vegetables, right? I have to tell you something. I was watching you while you were doing this, and this is what some of you were doing, quite a few of you. And I wanted to say their eyes were closed. Whatever works for you is fine, but there were birds and there were staircases and all sorts of things. So what do we have here? We have a lot, more in, a lot more visual information. You have a staircase with an ornate stair railing. You have a woman, we can see her backside, she's carrying a bag. There's a sign, she looks like she's walking from underground out into the outside. There's a sign that's not in English, it says Subida. And we have, now I'm from New York, pigeons, but you could call them anything. There are any kind of bird flying away. It's a lot of information and describers realize very quickly I can't do everything in here in 45 seconds. I just, I can't do it. So you did what you do every day. You prioritized the information because somebody was relying on you. You took the information that was in front of you. You had to decide what do I need, what don't I need. Somebody's relying on me and I have to give them the most salient description because they're relying on me to get a visual image in their mind to understand what I see. This is what we do every single day. So now I've thrown you into the deep end of the pool. Now we can really dive in further. So I show you an image that needs no explanation. But the reason I put it up there is because I, have a very, I had a very dear friend named Ahmed. He was a zoologist. And Ahmed's specialty was elephants. And I learned more about elephants in 20 years than any layperson really needs to know. But the most important elephant that Ahmed said always talk about the elephant in the room because if you don't, it will stomp on you and kill you. So I'm gonna just spend a minute or two talking about the elephant in the room that's right here. We need to stop camouflaging the toll that COVID has taken on every aspect of our lives. The virus has upended 
every single aspect of our lives, personally, professionally, individually, collectively, economically, socially, religiously, and not just here in Ogden and not just in my hometown, all over the world. When they talk global, they're not kidding. And, you know, I'm going to take another line from Winston Churchill. He said, never let a good crisis go to waste. And I really believe that. I believe that we are at a critical juncture right now, although I hear that New York has returned to a red zone as of today. We are at a critical juncture. We are not out of the woods yet, but we are at a place where we need to look back with a critical eye to see what went well in the last two years, what didn't go well, and every single one of you in the room can talk about one silver lining that happened in the last two years, whether it was personal, professional, you learned about your family, your own capacities, your ability to work remotely, and we need to bring those forward with us and turn those into gold. Uh, the elephant in the room, it's really very important, and I've also, for myself and for my colleagues and my clients and my business, I say this is not a time to survive, this is a time to thrive. We need to come out of this better than we went in. And I hope I can give you some tools tonight to do that because this is what's happened to our country. Literally and figuratively, everything we know has been turned upside down. And, you know, I keep hearing about the new normal, the new normal. I have terrible news. There is no new normal. Anything that's going to emerge from this two-year period is not going to look like it did two years ago. People are gonna wear masks forever. Maybe not you, but some people will wear masks. I will never get on the New York City subway ever again without a mask on, ever. I can just say that. I will never get on a train that is so crowded with people that I have to you know, squeeze my way in. I'll never do that again. The new normal will not look like our world, our normal of two years ago, and that's okay. But we have to be able to talk about that and acknowledge that openly. We can't pick up where we left off. We can't sweep it under the rug and say, okay, Everything's fine now. No, it's not fine. And we, as, as they say in one of my son's favorite children's movies, we've seen too much. So if you need a visual reminder of what has happened in the last two years, I'm gonna give you one from the art world. I'm showing you a work of art by the British artist Cornelia Parker. Now before you tell me the woman has too much time on her hands, bear with me, I promise it's relevant. So Cornelia Parker built the shed that you see on the left. She built it in her studio and I don't have a shed in New York City because we don't really have backyards in New York City. But I grew up with a shed in the backyard and I know what goes into it, all the stuff that you don't want to have in the house but you think you need and you're going to use for the outside. With the help of the British Army, Cornelia Parker then moved her shed to a field near the studio and she filled it with explosive devices. And then again, with the help of the British Army, she detonated them. Now again, I promise she doesn't have too much time on her hands. So then Cornelia Parker then went into the field and she picked up all the pieces of the exploded shed and their contents and she brought them into her studio. And they were burned and charred and distorted far beyond recognition and she had to repurpose, reframe, and rethink each of those pieces to create the sculpture on the right. And the sculpture that she built is called Cold Dark Matter. And I was lucky enough to see this sculpture when it was originally at the Tate Britain in 1992. And I am so overjoyed to tell you that this Monday I'll be in London and it's back in London, I get to see it live again. But I have to tell you that when I walked into the gallery, I don't like to read labels initially. I like to rely on my own sense of observation. And I walked into the gallery and I saw this and I could not figure out head from tail. It took up the whole gallery. It was lights and shadows. It had a funny smell. So when I finally broke down and read the label, at the risk of making a terrible pun, it kind of blew me away. <laughs> what she did, that she built this shed, moved it, filled it with explosives, detonated it. Why do I show this to you? Well, first of all, I know that this is not, I'm cognizant of the fact this is not a fully functioning shed. It's something better and something different. And in her initial shed, she had a single light that illuminated the inside of the shed. And the artist decided to put a single light back into her sculpture, not knowing the dimensions and the shadows that it would create. Why am I showing this to you? Because every shed that we had has been blown to smithereens, and it's time to start putting them back together. It's time to start rebuilding our sheds, fully recognizing that our sheds will not look like what they did two years ago. Now, why do you have to put your shed together in, for any reason? Why am I giving you this mandate? Because this is not an option. <laughs> 
Now, let me tell you what I've learned in the last two years. Any image you want to find on the, on the internet, you can find it, including a deer in the headlights. You can find anything you want. And I realized very quickly when I took that last flight in from Italy in February of 2020, I was a deer in the headlights. I was delivering presentations. I was training people all over the world. I was at NATO, for goodness sake, in Italy. And I came home, full stop, no more traveling, no more going anywhere. And I was the deer in the headlights. I thought, what am I going to do? What am I going to do? I have a business to run. I have a child to raise. I have bills to pay. How am I going to do this? So when NATO called in, in March and said, would you replicate your training virtually? Would you do it remotely for you know, people from 29 different countries? My first response was, no, I don't do that. But my second thought was, you don't say no to NATO. <laughs> so I decided, I said to them, you know what? If you're willing to go with me, I'll give it a try. I'll put together a remote presentation. I don't know how it's going to go, but I'll give it my best shot. Well, they pushed me to the end of the cliff. Then they pushed me off, and I flew. If I could do a remote presentation for people from 29 different countries, English was not the first language for the majority of them, and we had a grand old time. I could do it for anybody. But there are three things that I've taken with me over the last two years. I've learned many lessons, but three that I've brought with me that are going to help me moving forward when it comes to problem solving, both existing problems and new problems, and I want to share those things with you. The first one is to stop, look, and listen to pause. We were so busy before the pandemic going from point A to point B that we never stopped long enough to see if something was broken. We never stopped long enough to see if there might be a more efficient way to do what we're doing. If you look at this slide that I'm showing you, it's the largest equestrian sculpture in the United States outside of Irving, Texas. The horses are standing still and the water is moving. That's counterintuitive. That's not the way it's supposed to be, but those horses are standing still and the water is moving. The journalist Frank Bruni wrote a beautiful piece about the power of a pause, and this is what he said. A pause is when passions cool, civility gets oxygen, and wisdom finds its wings. Passions cool, civility gets oxygen, and wisdom finds its wings. We need to pause. We've had a forced pause for the last two years. And we've been forced to take note of things that we couldn't do before because we didn't have time. You need to incorporate the pause daily. And I'm not talking about meditating. I'm just talking about stopping to look and to listen to think if there might be a better way to do something. The second thing I took with me was it reminded me when back when we were traveling back in 2018, I saw this work of art at the Guggenheim in Bilbao. And once again, I walked into the gallery, and I didn't read the label, and I thought, what on earth am I looking at? This is a very large work of art by a woman named Joana Vesconcelos. She's a Portuguese artist. She's a tall, imposing woman, and she makes tall, imposing sculptures. And I was so taken with her craftsmanship, she made each of those mirrors. She, she welded them, and she soldered them together. And I was so taken with the detail of the mirrors that I honed right in on them, and I was checking out my hair, looking at my lipstick, you know, that's what you do when you look in a mirror. And I never stepped back long enough to realize that together the mirrors comprise a Venetian eye mask. I never saw that, because I was so focused on the details. And a year later, I'm flipping through a catalog of Vesconcelos' work, and I see this, and I say, oh, that's what that was. Now, other than being a little bit humiliated and feeling a little silly as an art historian that I missed the big picture, but for some people, especially in medicine, missing the big picture is dangerous. And we need to take the time to reconcile the big picture, our overarching goals for a patient or for research, with the small details. They're equally important. When people say, oh, I'm a detail person, I say, well, that's fine, but you also need to be a big picture person. And when we get so in the weeds, so laser focused and micro focused on those little details, because that's what you do when you get good, you lose the big picture, and I really believe it can be dangerous. So we need to take this time to reconcile the big picture and small details. And the third concept, the third big concept that I took with me, uh, came from a friend of mine at the FBI, and he introduced me to the concept of festina lente. Festina lente, it's Latin for make haste slowly. 
Again, counterintuitive. I love these things that are oxymoronic. To make haste slowly. That's what the Biglin brothers in this painting are trying to do. The Biglin brothers are in a one-paired oared shell, and they're rowing on the Schuylkill River. You can see their opponents behind them in the red boat. What do the Biglin brothers want to do? They want to cross the finish line before anybody else does. They want to win the race. But if they don't slow down to make sure that their oars are in perfect synchronicity, and if they don't slow down to communicate with each other that one has a cramp in his arm and one has to take over the rowing, everything's going to fall apart very quickly. We need to practice festina lente. We have to slow down to speed up. Because you may cross the finish line first, but if you don't do it right, you have to start all over again. And there's a theme here about slowing down during the pandemic. None of us had less work to do, but time became this kind of squishy parameter. The day didn't end. <laughs> Everything went on. Things remotely don't have the same parameters. So we need to practice festina lente. So I want to give you a visual illustration of what I want to do tonight. And to do this, I found this project in Southeast Michigan. I want you to think of your work as this barn. The owner of the barn, she loved the barn. It was beautiful. It had structural integrity, but she was worried about its future. She was worried about climate. She was worried about inclement weather. She was worried about what would happen if the barn ever became derelict. So to help her, she called in a design team. Katie Newell, an architect, came in with her design team, and this is what they did. They maintained the structural integrity of the barn, and they took out a perfect acute angle from foundation to roof. And the, the project was dubbed the secret sky. And the idea was to bolster the barn and let light in in a way so that you would see the barn differently than you did before. And this is the result. Quite stunning, isn't it? It marries the barn to the landscape in a way that was impossible before. You can see the barn and the sky and the landscape right through the structure, and it still has perfect integrity. But what I found most interesting about this project, as I do about most things when I look at them from another angle, is what Katie Newell and her team did is they didn't just think about the orientation of the barn from east to west. They thought about it at sunrise. They thought about it at sunset. They thought about it in inclement weather. And most ingeniously, they filled the barn with solar-powered lights so that at night, they could illuminate it from the inside, and you could see the interior of the barn in a way that you never could before, and it became a tourist destination. This is what I want to do with you tonight. I want to take an angle, just a slice out of your meeting and your evening, to let light in in a different way, to give you the tools to look at your work and your relationships and our almost post-COVID world in a different way. Now, for those of you that weren't here a few years ago, I'll give you just a very brief introduction as to who I am and why I'm qualified to stand on this stage and talk to you about why art is relevant to our lives every day. I am a recovering attorney. I'm also an art historian. And I, you're always in recovery once you're an attorney. And I like to think that I combine the practical aspects of each of those disciplines, legal analysis and visual analysis, when I created this company 20 years ago. I left the private practice of law and I went to work for a gem of an art museum in New York City called the Frick Collection. Some of you may know the Frick Collection. And I was there for 12 years. And while I was there, I started this program, but it was for medical students only. The idea was neither rocket science nor my idea. They were doing a program up at Yale with dermatology residents. And the idea was really very simple. Take the dermatology residents out of their clinical setting bring them to an art museum, teach them how to analyze works of art, so when they return to that clinical setting, the hope was that they would be better observers of and communicators with their patients. So with Yale's very gracious permission, I started a version of that program in New York with Weill Cornell Medical School, which was my neighbor at the Frick Collection. The program soon expanded to seven medical schools, eight medical schools. I had medical students coming and going, and white coats, everything. it was wonderful. And one night I was out to dinner, though, and I was telling my friends that my medical students <laughs> didn't just have vision like this. They had vision like this. It was all about hematomas and kidney stones and MRIs and blood, you know, any, which is what you would expect from medical students. And one of my friends said, why are you just doing this for medical students? Why aren't you doing this for other professions that need good observation skills? I said, like whom? He said, like cops. Why aren't you doing this for, you know, homicide detectives? Don't they need to see well? And I thought, you're right, why am I not? So that was Saturday night, Monday morning, I picked up the phone and I called my local police department, the NYPD, the poor guy that picked up the phone, poor man. I said, hi, I'm Amy Herman, I 
have a great idea, I'm head of education at the Frick Collection, uh, I train medical students to enhance their observation skills by learning to look at works of art, and I think you should send homicide detectives to my museum. <laughs> well, that was a lead balloon. <laughs> and the poor guy at the switchboard didn't know what to do with me, so he transferred me this many times. Until I got to a deputy commissioner who has since passed away but became such a good friend, and I'll never forget what he, I knew he got it. He said to me, Miss Herman, if this is such a visual thing, why are we on the phone? <laughs> Mm, right? Six months later, every newly promoted captain in the NYPD had to take my course at the Frick Collection, and that is me in the center top picture training my first group of homicide investigators of the NYPD at the Metropolitan Museum of Art, where I also have lecturing privileges. That collaboration made it to the front page of the Wall Street Journal in 2005, and my world exploded like Cornelia Parker shed. Boom! Everything as I knew it blew up. So. I got calls from all over the world, and they all said the same thing, come teach us to see like you did those cops in New York. I can't teach anybody how to see. I, I, I'm not a neuroscientist, but what I can do, what I'm going to do with you tonight, similar to what I did four years ago, but in a completely different context, four A's. Every new patient, every new problem, any new situation, you practice four A's. You assess it, you analyze it, you articulate it, and you act every single day, but we forget how intertwined observation and perception are to those four A's. So after that article appeared in the Wall Street Journal, I had to quit my job at the Frick Collection because I couldn't continue to uh, fulfill all the requests, and I've been running around the world since then. It's now my honor and privilege to work with 13 divisions of the NYPD. Uh, I work in every branch of the military. I train Special Operations United uh, Navy SEALs. I work in financial services, I work with shock and trauma nurses, I do critical response, uh, hospitality, blah, blah, blah. You know, I wrote three books, who cares? You don't care. I, I don't need to tell you that. Why do I tell you? Because I have a very unique lens across the professional spectrum. And after training thousands of people around the world, you know what I realized? If you're in my session, you already have good, if not extraordinary, observation and perception skills. That's not the problem. The problem is in the consistent breakdown of the effective communication of what it is that we observe. Something gets lost from our seeing eyes to our speaking mouths to our typing fingers and our texting thumbs, and I don't know what it is. So I use art to fill the gap, and for some crazy reason, it's working. And my three goals for you tonight are not dissimilar to what they were four years ago, but we've tweaked them. Number one, I want each of you leaving this session thinking differently about one aspect of your work. Number two, I want to help you convert observable details into actionable knowledge. And number three, I want to help you fix what's broken. But I forgot, nothing's broken, right? I want to clean your lenses so you can see your existing resources differently to craft more innovative and more sustainable solutions. That's all I want, those three things. So that's how I got here, and that's what we're going to be doing. But like last time, I'm going to ask you to shift your perspective like this guy. His name is JR. Why do you even have to shift your perspective? Because I know you don't look at art for a living. Nobody I work with looks at art for a living. JR shifted his perspective to make this self-portrait. I think it's brilliant. It's called Self-Portrait in a Woman's Eye, Kenya 2009. You probably guessed that. Why is it brilliant? Because he had to shift his perspective on self-portraiture and take a por portrait of himself, and you don't know what he looks like. Why? If you know what he looked like, it was easier to get arrested. Why would JR be arrested? Because he never got warrants to do his artwork. He would just put his photographs anywhere he wanted in the world, and some countries didn't like it. So he continued to practice his art, but he didn't want to show you what he looked like, and he redefined self-portraiture. Now, I'm going to make the assumption that no one in this room is trying to evade arrest like JR, and if you are, don't tell me. So why would you need to shift your perspective? Because here's your world in a nutshell. I didn't have enough real estate to cover all the issues that we are facing in the world right now. You have the society in the center. The world is still subsumed by the coronavirus. We're contemplating fourth shots in New York. We're still on Zoom. Gas is through the roof. Dis disruptive technology is everywhere. I just have to say Ukraine. I just have to say the Supreme Court. Cra travel is curtailed. And we are still communicating on a 24-7 news cycle and on social media 24-7, it's enough to give you a headache. But you know what? You can't turn away from this. There's no bright line between the world you live in and the world you work in. It's the same world. And the sooner you're able to shift your perspective on the world you live in, the more effective and greater impact you're going to have in the world you work in. They're not separate spheres. And the truth is, you don't have the professional option of looking the other way. 
as much as we don't want to face what we don't want to face, you have no choice. This cover of the Arts and Leisure section of the New York Times was tailor-made for me. It was about looking at art. Can art look the other way? And they turned 10 paintings around so you see the frames on the back. You don't have that luxury, and truthfully, neither does art. You can't look the other way. This is not what you can do when you don't want to go to work. <laughs> Dora Mars photograph. We don't have that option. I wish we did. Some days you really want to, but you can't. So why do I choose art? Number one, I love it. That's my academic, my choice of academic training. But more than that, art gives us an opportunity from the craziness of a 17th century painting on the left to the simplicity of a 21st century still life and everything in between to think about the issues in our world and in our work Think about them through a different lens and then go back to where we were. Because I believe that the best things happen on the edge of your comfort zone. It used to be that the homicide detectives would say, are you kidding me? I'm going to sit in a room with this woman for three hours and look at paintings? Are you kidding me? It's about leaving your comfort zone so that when you come back in, you're looking at things through different lenses. And art gives us the means to do that. But tonight I want to focus on problem solving, because I know nothing's broken. But I want to introduce you, some of you may know, the art of one of my favorite artists. His name is Giorgio Morandi. Now, art historians have one of two reactions when I introduce, when I say Morandi, they say, oh God, not Morandi, not Morandi, he's so boring. And others, like me, love the quiet of his paintings, the quiet subtext of ideation, of moving things. What Morandi does, he specialized in the still life. And Morandi's whole body of work was vases, bottles, bowls, and jars. Vases, bottles, bowls, and jars. And he moved them around, and he shifted them, and he moved them in different light, in different shadow. You see why people yawn and say, God, not Morandi. But I love his work because it took me years of looking at his work to understand that it really wasn't about the vases, bottles, bowls, and jars. It was about the subtlety of light. It was about shadow, it was about weight, it was about capturing the attributes of all these things. And the truth is, all of us in this room move the vases, bottles, bowls, and jars around every day. We have the same bottles, bowls, and jars, it's just how we choose to move them around to do a day's work or solve our problems. And the other, other reason I think Morandi's work is so incredible is that he was born in Bologna, he died in Bologna, and I think in his entire life he left Italy three times. The man had a very limited vision in one sense, but in looking at the weight of objects and the subtleties and the nuances and the shadow and the appearance, it was limitless. He did thousands and thousands of paintings, and I love Morandi. But before we can get to problem solving, we have to sort of review a bit from four years ago and lay the groundwork and remember that no two people see anything the same way. That includes problems and solutions. I'm showing you two portraits of the lovely Mrs. Chester Dale. They were benefactors of the National Gallery in Washington. The painting on the left is by Fernand Leger and the painting on the right is by George Bellows. If I didn't tell you they were the same person, would you necessarily know it? No. <laughs> Why? Because no two people see anyone, any patient, any person the same way. But the other interesting thing is that we can see the same person, but we can see a situation differently depending on our external circumstances. When I was a litigator, nobody wanted to go before Judge Brown in the morning because it was known that Judge Brown was not a morning person. You wanted to have your argument in the afternoon if you had Judge Brown at 8 o'clock in the morning, God help you. <laughs> but I'm showing you two paintings now by Rembrandt. They're both by Rembrandt. And my classes are secular, but I use narratives from the Old Testament and the New Testament because they're so rich. I'm showing you the exact same narrative. It's the Supper at Emmaus when the resurrected Christ sits at the table and breaks bread with two disciples and they slowly realize who he is. And on the right, look at that dramatic light. It's hard to see here, but one of the, oops, sorry, I pressed the wrong button. Let's try that again. One of the disciples has fallen to his knees and he's knocked over the chair. It's kind of hard to see here. And this one looks like the fear of God is in him. And 20 years later, Rembrandt did the same scene, but everybody's just taking a deep breath. 
Christ has revealed himself, but we're looking at the architecture and the perspective, and there's a servant in each who has no idea what's going on, but everything is just taken down a notch 20 years later. The same man, the same subject, completely different depictions of the scene. Why do I tell you this? Because you're not Judge Brown, but maybe some of you aren't mourning people. But I walked into a museum recently, and I don't like to read labels, but I read a wall, a wall text and it really resonated with me. And you know what it said? How we look at something is fundamental to what we see. How we look at something is fundamental to what we see. So your external circumstances have a lot to do with how and what it is that you see. We're not all Rembrandt, but give yourself some room. But when it comes to problem solving, you need to shift your perspective. Why? Because there's never just one solution to a problem. And it behooves all of us to get multiple perspectives because quite, quite selfishly, multiple perspectives make for better decision making. So I'm showing you a painting by Richard Estes of four people having their coffee and dessert, smoking their cigarettes, having their coffee. But you never think of looking down on people having dessert. It's just sort of a foreign angle. But why do we have to shift our perspective? Because the ground has been shifting under us for two years. The ground has been shifting under us, and every day I'd have to wake up and regain my balance. You're looking at a photograph by Cartier-Bresson. Where are you? What's happening? Are you dizzy? Are you at the top of the stairs? Who's on the bike? And what the pandemic has done, shifted the ground under us, and we constantly, now I don't drive, but I'm going to admit I'm in a car a lot, and that with GPS, I don't even know how to use a GPS, when it says recalculating, <laughs> recalculating. I'm fascinated by that. The GPS recalculates based on where you are. Fascinating, says the New Yorker who hasn't driven in 25 years. But the ground is shifting and we have to constantly be recalculating. And this is called, in my world, situational awareness. Situational awareness has two forms, short term and long term. Short-term situational awareness is, where am I right now at this minute? How did I get here? Who's around me? And how do I get out safely? And how would I articulate my circumstances should something go wrong at this minute? Long-term situational awareness, we are aware of a problem, but we haven't wrapped our head around its solution yet. So the picture that I'm showing you, some of you may recognize, Pulitzer Prize winning photograph from the New York Times, September 2013, Nairobi, Kenya, the Westgate Mall. This woman came into the mall. Do you have Williams Sonoma out here in Utah? You know Williams Sonoma is the cooking store. This woman went to a Williams Sonoma kind of store in the Westgate Mall, and whether her short-term situational awareness because of maternity kicked in, she knew that the counter at which they were going to work was fortified by a wall and had another counter behind it. So that when the Al-Shabaab militants came in, and commence their massacre, she knew that she could take her children, hide between those two spaces, and she sang to her children for five hours. She sang for five hours, and they survived. 68 other people did not. And when I read the aftermath reports, when I read the intel reports of what happened at the Westgate Mall, it was fascinating. People found, the, people found shelter in air ducts. Who knows where an air duct is in a shopping mall? People hid in stoves and ovens and closets. We don't know where those spaces are in a shopping mall, but their situational awareness kicked in and 68 other people's did not because they died in the massacre. So we need to ask three questions in situational awareness. Any problem we have to solve, where are we? This is what I taught my son when he took the subway for the first time. Ask three questions. What do I know? What don't I know? And if I had the opportunity to get more information, what do I need to know? What do I know? What do I see right now? What don't I know? Identify what's missing. What don't I see? Who's not here? How do I get downstairs if I can't use the elevator? And the third question, if I had the opportunity to get more information, what do I need to know? You don't have to know everything you don't know. Home in on what you need to know. But one of the things where I differ with a lot of my colleagues is the idea of distractions. People say, focus on the end of the road, focus on the prize, get through. No, I believe that you need to take distractions into account because there are too many red herrings in the world. I'm showing you a painting by Carrie James Marshall called Untitled Gallery. What is it? It's a single black woman, it's a figure. She looks like she's posing for a photograph. And there are spotlights behind two uh, works of art. We can see the frame of one to her left. 
and she has short hair, and she's wearing a patterned sweater, and she has a different patterned skirt, and she has yellow fingernail polish and a white ring and big white earrings. But if you look at the photograph next to her, it's a woman on a bearskin rug, and there's glass in the front because you can see a reflection of the gallery and the space. is so much information, distraction after distraction after distraction. Take it all into account and still keep your eye on where you need to go because nobody can ever drown out all the distractions. So now I'm going to put you back to work with your partner, and I'm going to put this painting up. I'm going to put this painting up. And I want you to take just one minute with your partners, discuss what do you know, what don't you know, and I want you to come out of the discussion with one question. If you had the opportunity to get more information about what you see, what do you need to know here? Go ahead, quick discussion. All right, start to wrap up your conversations. So, you know what's fascinating? I was watching all of you, as I'm always watching you. I didn't tell you the name of the painting. I didn't tell you the name of the artist. I didn't tell you, that didn't matter. You were all like, look at that, look at that. And you were discussing this like art historians. You were using your visual information and your visual intelligence to discuss the data in front of you. It's almost irrelevant who painted this. Now, just by show of hands, how many of you mentioned the needlepoint purse that the woman on the right is carrying? How many of you noticed the purse? Good. Now, I want to see how many people mentioned that damn hen. Who talked about the chicken or the hen? Everybody, right? So what do we have here? This is actually a very complex painting. You have a background, a middle ground, and a foreground. You've got some rural buildings. You've got barns and a house. And then you have fields in the middle ground. And then you have two figures who seem to be the subject. The woman on the right, they're both wearing hats, and the woman on the right we're seeing in profile, right? We see her double chin, we see her, uh, her hat with a hat pin, and she appears to have a fur-like collar and a coat, and then there's that needlepoint purse tucked under her arm that might suggest some kind of monetary transaction is going on. And then you have the person who we see in three-quarter view in a green jacket dressed very differently than the person on the right. And I'm going to refrain from identifying gender because A, I don't know, and B, it really doesn't matter, but it might not be male, female, in between, outside, doesn't matter. I don't know what the gender is of that person, and I'm not going to try to identify it. Wearing a hat, holding the hen, the bantam hen, in a rather possessive kind of way. And so the question, you know, the, the one thing, if you had the opportunity to get more information, what do you want to know? What's the relationship between these two people? What's the subject of the transaction? What's the deal with the head? Who owns the farm? There are so many questions that you could raise here. But the interesting thing is when people tell me, oh, they're talking this, they're talking that, nobody's mouth is open. Notice that? Nobody's mouth is open, and I'm going to give you a real life scenario. Have you ever pushed the button for an elevator? and the doors open and there are two people in the elevator and you know that the minute before those doors open, those two people were fighting. They were having a fight. Do you know that feeling? And you're like, I don't want to get into this elevator. But how do you know that? It's their body language. It's, they say, oh, tension in the elevator. No, it's not tension in the elevator. It's using your visual information to say these people were just having an argument and it's really hot in here. How do we take our visual information and use that template? What do I know? What don't I know? If I had the opportunity to get more information, what do I need to know? When it comes to problem solving, it's a brilliant little template. 
and I got it from the CIA. Their open source document is called the Psychology of Intelligence Analysis. Let me tell you, I tried to read it every night. That was my assignment, better than Ambien, truly. But there was one chapter on perception that gave me that three-prong model, and I won't lie to you, I use it all the time. But what this involves is a kind of agility that all of us need, not only as a result of the pandemic, we should be more agile anyway. I'm showing you two works of art by the artist Umberto Boccioni. And I'm showing you two works from 1913. One's a sculpture, one's a painting by the same artist. He can depict motion in lots of different ways. I'm not asking you to be an artist, but I'm asking you to think about agility in two ways. Number one, expressing your talent in, in more than one way, because truly that's what the times demand of us now. We have to do, we have to wear a lot of hats. And number two, Give your colleagues and the people that work with and for you the opportunity to rise to the occasion and be agile themselves. Why? Because that's how better teams are built. It's tempting to pigeonhole people and say, well, Sarah's really good at gathering data, and John's really good at research, and Xavier's good at, you know, I don't know what Xavier's good at. Give them opportunities to be more agile and to do other things. Because should one of those people leave your team, if you don't give them that opportunity, there's going to be a gaping hole that they leave. And so to solve the problem, give people other opportunities to be agile. And I want to give you a visual illustration of agility and know you're not looking at a head of broccoli. So let's just say, without giving away my age, I am too old to take red eyes. Okay, I'm just too old, but there are times in my life I have to get from point A to point B, and I have no choice. Like I'm leaving the hotel at 4.45 tomorrow morning. Not quite a red eye. And there's an unwritten rule on a red eye, don't talk to anybody before 7 a.m. Just don't do it. Just give everybody an opportunity to get whatever sleep they can. So I'm taking a red eye from the west coast to the east coast, 5 o'clock in the morning, and we're flying over the Ozarks, and the pilot, of all people, picks up the PA at 5 o'clock in the morning, breaking the rule, and says, hey, folks, it's a pilot here in the cockpit. If any of you are sitting on the right side of the plane and can lift your shade, you'll really have a beautiful sight. And I thought, you're waking me up to look out the window. And this is what I saw. This is what I saw over the Ozarks, and I am forever indebted to that pilot because he introduced me to one of the most beautiful concepts. It's not even a work of art, it's Mother Nature's work, and it's called crown shyness. What crown shyness is, when certain species of trees get to a certain height and a certain place in their growth, you know what they do? They get out of each other's way, and they form these exquisite patterns for a very practical reason. If their leaves and branches get all entangled with each other, everything beneath them will be deprived of sunlight and die. What's the analogy for leadership? Get out of each other's way. You're all good at what you do, you're seasoned, you're respected. If you don't get out of each other's way, everything beneath you is going to die. And I've had some very interesting responses to crown shyness. Uh, one group, actually, it was a group of um, shock and trauma nurses, said to me, you know, when you get out of each other's way, you have better opportunities to create clarity. You can actually talk about things. But my favorite happened this week. I was at a financial institution in New York, and one of the managing directors said, in this bank, you lead, you follow, or you get out of the way. He said, but you know what crown shyness teaches me? Maybe getting out of the way is the best way to lead. Think about stepping back, doing what you do well, and giving everyone around you some air. But again, that takes agility. But tonight I told you I want to focus on problem solving. I want us to think about what's broken, but I want to shift your perspective on what's broken to think about the artwork of Stephen Young Lee. This is his final product. He incorporates the brokenness into his works of art. And they have their own beauty. And as I've seen so much brokenness over the last two years, I've changed my own perspective. Let's not sweep our mistakes under the rug and say, no, 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 let's just move on to successes. Make the brokenness part of the solution. That is the underlying concept of kintsugi. For those of you that are not familiar with the Japanese ceramic process, Japanese ceramicists and artists, they make bowls and vases. They make the stuff from Mirandi. <laughs> they make bowls and vases and cups, and it is inevitable that some of these are going to come out broken or asymmetrical or imperfect. And rather than throw the, the flawed pottery away, 
these ceramicists gather the broken pieces and they fill them in with gold and silver and platinum lacquer. And you know what happens to these pieces? They become more precious and more valuable than had they been perfect in the first place. None of you are professional potters or ceramicists. You may do it as a hobby. But that doesn't mean I can't ask you the question, how are you practicing kintsugi? How are you fixing what's broken in your departments, in your practices, in your offices, with the resources that you already have? Because we are coming out of a pandemic now. This is not the time to bring in far-flung, we don't have the time, human or, or financial resources, to bring in these far-flung ideas. How can you look at what's available to you at your fingertips? And I think one of the most beautiful things about Kintsugi is it honors the struggle. It brings the mistakes to the fore and says, you know what, I'm not going to sweep the mistake under the rug. I'm going to incorporate it into my solution and show everybody what went wrong, not only because to show I'm not perfect, but perhaps I can prevent them from making the same mistake that I did. And I'm going to take this one step further, another Japanese concept. It's called wabi-sabi, embracing the imperfect. How can we embrace the imperfect and say, you know what, this is OK, without compromising your standards? And I'm showing you wabi-sabi occurs in nature. It occurs in ceramics. It's the acceptance of accepting the imperfect. And I'll give you a practical example of wabi-sabi that we had in New York. Uh, his name is Lewis Miller. Lewis Miller is floral designer to the stars. And he makes these six-figure, I mean, you can't get flowers from Lewis Miller. He's booked a year and a half in advance. And he makes these gargantuan uh, installations of flowers for parties. And he was really started to feel kind of empty because the party would be over. And yeah, they could give the flowers to hospitals or you know, rehabilitation centers, but he felt that they were going to waste. So you know what he did? They gathered up the flowers, and they put them all over New York City and called it Flower Flash. And they'd fill garbage cans and surround hydrants and put them around statues. And it didn't matter if the dog peed on it or somebody threw their garbage in the garbage can. There was a level of imperfection, imperfection that made it even more beautiful. And there were no demands. And there was nobody yelling at Lewis Miller, get my flowers right. We were lucky to have the flowers on the street in the first place. Nobody's going to yell at them, at him. Flower flash. But what does it mean for you? You're not floral designers. It means looking at ordinary things, like the photographer Eric Kogan, and seeing the extraordinary. Looking at things that you see every day through a new set of lenses. Here's another one of Kogan's photographs. I just love it. I just love it. Seeing things, not necessarily detritus or pollution, but just seeing everyday things through a new set of eyes. Another artist that I want to talk to you about about solving problems is Irving Penn, the photographer. He's a 20th century photographer uh, who took the frozen food, you know, the first image that you looked at with your partner. In 1948, Irving Penn created this suite of photographs. He built, a wall, he built two walls. He made a corner like this. And he invited 50 famous people, the Duchess of Windsor, Martha Graham, E.B. White, Louis Armstrong, you know, art, sciences, authors. And he invited them to pose in the corner. And he created these portraits, and guess what they're called? Portraits in a corner. Or the corner portraits, if you're on the inside. But here's the weird thing. Who wants to pose in a corner? <laughs> it's confining. It's unnatural. Not a single subject that he invited said no. People brought props. They got all dressed up. They brought chairs, their pipes. And you know what they did? They just create, they expressed themselves in a creative way, and it made this really beautiful set of photographs. Why do I tell you? Because every single person in this room has been literally or figuratively backed into a corner in their professional lives, maybe in your personal lives, but we won't go there. Everybody has been backed into the corner. And I know that the goal is, when you're backed into a corner, to get out. But I'm going to give you one more call to action when it comes to being backed into the corner. What can you do while you're there? What can you do while you're backed into the corner to shift your situational awareness and say, this sucks. <laughs> I need to get out of here, but what can I do to improve the situation? Because we all know full well we're going to be backed into a corner. And let me give you a heroic example that happened in New York City at the beginning of the pandemic. Before we had vaccinations, we had morgues on the street. We had people dying. Thousands and thousands of people were dying in New York City every day, and we ran into a critical shortage of PPE. Hospitals, nursing homes were going through PPE. 
at a rate they just not, could not keep up. And one of the biggest problems happened in critical care centers. And the IV bag would run out, the alarm would go off, a nurse would get up from his or her station, put on fresh PPE, go in, take the bag down, put another bag up, come out, strip the PPE, throw it away, put on a new set and go back to the station until the next alarm rang and they had to do it over and over again. They were going through masks and shields and aprons at an alarming rate. And somebody had the brilliant idea to move the IV poles into the hallway. Move the IV poles into the hallway, so the alarm rings, the nurse gets up, no change of PPE, goes, takes the bag down, puts a new one, goes back to the station, no change of PPE. Is it a long-term sustainable solution? Not really, because you're missing contact between the nurse and the patient. Is there a chance that the IV poles can be confused? Is it gonna cause a safety hazard in the hallway? Possibly, but to solve the problem while you're backed into the corner, Let's bring the IV poles into the hallway so nobody has to change PPE, and it became a model across the country. It started at Montefiore in the Bronx. It was an underserved hospital, absolutely inundated with critical care patients on ventilators, no vaccines yet, solved the problem. And you know what the resource was? Extra tubing. Montefiore doesn't have a lot. They had extra tubing. And all they had to do was stretch the tubing from the uh, ICU out into the hallway. That's what I mean by solving problems with resources that you already have. One caveat I want to give you has to do with context. And you're thinking, where's she going with this? With this naked white guy walking in his sleep. It's a sculpture by the artist Tony Mattelli. And uh, Mattelli created this sculpture called, you guessed it, The Sleepwalker. And it was installed on the campus of Wellesley College in 2014. There were works of art in the museum, and Mattelli put this one sculpture on campus. Fewer than 24 hours later, there was a hue and cry, take it down, we hate it. For those of you that don't know, Wellesley College is all female. It's all female campus. The women hated it, they said. It's frightening, it's scary, it's triggering, it's reminding us of sexual assault, take it down. And much to my relief, they had a town hall meeting and the director of the museum and the president of the college decided to leave it up because taking it down amounted to censorship. You can't take down things just because you don't like them. But here's the interesting thing. When Mattelli's sculpture finally came down, its next stop was on the High Line in New York, the most photographed selfie there ever was. People stood on line. I went there, they were giggles and laughing and selfies, and they were kissing the white dude in his underwear. And at Wellesley, not so much. It's all about context. I talk a lot in my program with the intelligence community, with medicine, about pattern recognition. Pattern recognition is so important because you're calling on your experience, you're calling on your work, but the caveat is don't let pattern recognition evolve into patterns of expectation. Everything has its own context, and you need to call on that context, and you need to articulate it. So one last problem-solving example I want to give you before I connect the dots, then open the floor to questions. Some of you may recognize these pictures from the news in October of this past year, October of 2021, in Pine, Colorado. I train game wardens, too. And they caught this wild elk on video. And once you get over the absurdity of this situation, you realize how very sad it is. This one elk, when it was young, came in contact with human pollution. It got a tire lodged around its neck, and then it grew antlers, so it couldn't dislodge the tire. Now, <laughs> I have a better chance of you in Utah knowing about tasing an elk than me in New York City. I haven't tased too many elks on Broadway, but I'm gonna defer to you on this one. They tried for a long time to tase the elk, and it's hard to tase a wild elk. And they finally got it down. And when they went to saw the tire off the elk's neck, they ran into problem number two. It had a steel rim in it. Now, even I know, white middle-aged woman from Manhattan, knows that when you tase an elk, you don't have a big window of opportunity there. It's gonna wake up, even I know that. So they had to make their decision quickly. And you know what, the decision was brilliant, and I think the takeaway was even greater. They shaved off the antlers, pulled the tire off. And the reason they did it in the first place is the game wardens were worried that there was gonna be a laceration from the, tire, uh, from the tire, and it was eventually gonna kill the elk, or scenario B was that another elk was gonna see the tire as a threat and kill the elk, so they wanted to get the tire off. So they ended up shaving off the antlers, antlers, elk woke up, ran away, grew its antlers back, happy end of the story. What's the takeaway for you? 
What is the overarching problem here? The overarching problem is that wildlife comes in contact with human pollution. In our lifetime, that is not going to be solved. As aspirational as it is, and as much as I like to think that wildlife is not going to come into contact with human pollution, it's not going to happen. So in this case, they had to make sure that perfection is not the enemy of good. There are times that good has to be good enough, and I bet every single one of you, if any of you are parents, you know that as parents, good just has to be good enough sometimes. There are times when you have to staunch the bleeding. There are times when you have to put a Band-Aid on and say, you know what, I can't solve this problem. I'm going to do what I can do, and I'm going to move on where I can make a bigger difference. Don't let perfection be the enemy of good. And I'm not saying not to strive for perfection. I'm saying make the judicious decision when you can't get to perfection, to let good be good enough, and here's the hard line, this is pot calling the kettle black, and then let it go. It's a really hard thing to do, but we have to practice it. I lied, there's one more story. So some of you may recognize the works of art that I'm showing you. Uh, these are by Christo and Jean-Claude. They were romantic partners, they were husband and wife, and they were also artistic partners, and what their thing was to wrap things. Their whole art career, they wrapped in the upper left-hand corner of the Reichstag in Berlin. They wrapped the Pont Neuf in the center. They hung up the gates in Central Park in 2006. That's the Valley Curtain in California. And in the lower right, they wrapped an island off the coast of Italy. Really cool stuff. They raised their own money. They overcame all kinds of environmental hurdles. And um, I love Christo and Jean-Claude's work. Jean-Claude died in 2009. And Christo's last project was to wrap the Arc de Triomphe in Paris. And it, he and Jean-Claude worked 50 years. It's a Bulgarian artist. He wasn't even French. And you know, you don't mess with the French, especially if you're not French. You don't mess with them. And so Christo's last project was to realize the wrapping of the Arc de Triomphe. And the project was delayed twice. First, because some rare species of birds decided to build a nest the first year, and he wasn't going to disrupt the environmental harmony. And the second year was pandemic. And then very sadly, last spring, Christo died. And I was so upset, but his studio made the decision to go ahead with the wrapping of the Arc de Triomphe. So posthumously, they were going to realize Christo's dream. And I said, COVID be damned. As an art historian, I said, I want to see Christo's last project with my own eyes. I don't want to see photographs. I want to see it because it was a once in a lifetime opportunity. There is never going to be another Christo project. So my family didn't stand in my way. And the next pictures you're going to see are mine. I went to Paris. And this is what I saw. And it was absolutely spectacular to see this iconic arch wrapped in this silvery blue fabric. And when I got up close, it was like a woman's dress with a belt. I mean, I, I spent four days. And the thing about Christo's projects, they're always ephemeral. They're usually 10 days to 14 days, and then they come down purposefully. I say this with the greatest humility. The French National Police are my client, and they escorted me to the top. So I got to see Paris. It's always raining in Paris, but who cares? You're looking from the top of the Arc de Triomphe in this, with the red wrapping, and you're seeing the, the Eiffel Tower and the Champs-Élysées. And I'm not exaggerating when I tell you that it changed my view of my work and what I do and how I see art. And then I came down, and I took pictures at night. And then, of course, it stops raining the next day. As they unwrap the Arc de Triomphe, the sun comes out. They open it up to traffic. And my last night, this is what I saw, and I knew that it was time to go home. Why do I show this to you? Because what I realized, the reason it had such an impact on me, is because I said, you don't mess with the French and you don't mess with their Arc de Triomphe. I mean, this is Napoleon commissioned this thing. It's true to the heart of every French person. And this Bulgarian artist came in, solved all these problems, raised the money, wrapped it, unwrapped it, and he was dead the whole time in the ground. There is no problem that is ever completely insurmountable. Nothing is so difficult. There's nothing that can't be changed. Nothing is immutable. And when I came home, I was just bursting at the seams about what I saw in Paris over four days. And my family, my poor family, had to hear all about it. And as a gift for me last year, they bought me a little gold Arc de Triomphe to wear around my neck. It's my little superpower to remind me that there are no problems that can't be solved. Blah, 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 blah. 
been looking at art for an hour and 15 minutes. I said, I want you to leave thinking differently about one aspect of your work. What, do you, what are the things you're going to take away? Number one, things are going to go wrong. Okay, let's just admit it now, but if somebody handed me a donut right now, <laughs> I'd eat it very quickly. We need to understand the consequences of our observations and convert observable details into actionable knowledge. Number two, I hate to break it to you, you can't fix everything. You want to believe you can. Glenn Taylor found broken cups and saucers in his mother's attic and he tried to fix it with barbed wire. It didn't work. But the artist Tati Fritas, She's from Brazil and she took broken furniture and she repaired it with lacquer and acrylic. It may not be your taste, but it's functional. Decide what you can fix. Decide what has the potential to be fixed. And be brave enough to say what you can't fix and get rid of it. Delegate it to somebody else, get rid of it, and focus your limited resources on where you can make a difference. Look for common ground. I don't need to tell you the world is the most divisive place right now and we haven't even gotten today's election results yet. The world is so divisive, look for common ground. I'm showing you an American painter on the left and an Italian sculptor on the right, they never met. You don't need an art degree to see how similar they are. Things are eventually gonna divide, start from common ground, and I'm not gonna lie, sometimes finding common ground is harder than it sounds. When you look at the work of Vuillard and Louise Fishman, centuries apart, and yet you can see similarities. You have to look hard to find the common ground, but I really believe it's there. One of the things I heard during the pandemic that I can't stand and I don't want to hear is when people say, oh, we were all in the same boat. We were never in the same boat, never. We had different resources and capabilities and strengths and weaknesses before the pandemic. The truth is we were all in the same storm. But now as that storm starts to abate, we need to acknowledge and say again, we are still not in the same boat. And we have to acknowledge that, yes, we've all come through the storm, but recognize some people have suffered grievous loss in this pandemic. Some people got COVID and were completely asymptomatic. I mean, it's, it runs the gamut. Nobody was similarly situated and in exactly the same boat. There is no doubt that the world is still upside down. It is but I really do believe we are at a critical juncture now to look back, to be able to look forward, to be able to ask better questions, to put new lenses on to solve the problems, because you know what? Nobody can see around corners, but I have news. There's something else. There's a new variant. There's another, you know, there's another pandemic coming. There could be anything, and we need to have more arrows in our quiver. I kind of see the world as the controlled chaos of the work of Julie Maritou, one of my favorite painters. She uses all kinds of media, paint, pencil, pastel, ink. But it doesn't have to be this controlled chaos. But don't strive for this, because you're going to come up short. Nobody's life is ever going to be this symmetrical. And you know what? Asymmetry is OK. Because you have to remember not to let perfection be the enemy of good. Now, for those of you that are old enough to understand this reference, this call is coming from inside the house. OK? The horror movie that the killer is inside the house. Nobody's telling you to do any of this. Nobody's telling you to take these steps to think about creative solutions and being innovative. It has to come from inside of you. You're going to make mistakes as if you, I have to tell you that. When I was 11 years old, I wanted to go to the Whitney Biennial. I liked art back then, and I went with my father. And I was all grown up. I was going to go to the ladies' room all by myself. So I asked this guard for directions to the ladies' room. The guard was a sculpture made in 1976 by Dwayne Hansen. My family has never let me forget it, that I asked the stuffed guard where the ladies' room was. Learning to laugh at yourself and your mistakes and make them part of the solution, that's another way to solve a problem. Probably my favorite work of art in this presentation, Tables Rising by Jennifer Odom. It's standing sentinel in the Mississippi River on the banks of New Orleans. I schlepped all the way out there to get pictures of this. It's seven tables stacked on top of each other, rising up against adversity and guarding against post-Katrina floodwaters. This symbolism of it is so beautiful. When the levees break in New Orleans and the floodwaters come in and flood the homes of the lower wards, what do people do with their valuables? They put them on the table. 
When we can't agree on a solution, what do we do? We come to the table. This is a reminder that we need to take affirmative steps to affect positive change. This doesn't happen on its own. You can't sit back and let it wait to happen to you. You need to be the problem solver. You need to see the resources with new eyes. It's about looking at, for new sources of light. I love to look back to look for new sources of light. When your eyes adjust to this painting, it's a painting from 1629, and when your eyes adjust and you see it, you begin to see the extraordinary window and the source of light and the man at his desk and the interior of the room, and it's a reminder to all of us to always look for new sources of light. It's the epitome of the growth mindset. Yeah, you're good at what you do, you're talented, but you need to get better, you need to stay on the edge because we don't want to get left behind. And my last slide, that is my website. Those are the books that I've written. I have a young adult book coming out in October. It's for ages 10 to 14 based on visual intelligence. And one of my favorite Ed Ruscha paintings, I will end this talk saying, you know what I mean when I say the time for this is now. Thank you very much for having me. Now, thank you. Um, I would be happy to take a few questions for a couple minutes, and then I'm going to be signing some books in the back where the books are. So if any of you would like a book, uh, they're back there. And if anybody has any questions, I'd be happy to take them. If you, if, oh. if you have a question, come up to the microphone, which I'm not doing right now, just because the people streaming online won't be able to hear you. So please come to the microphone. Anybody? You used all your energy uh, to do the ex exercises. I, more than a question, I had a, um, a, a thought. I just, well, there was a lot of moments that really got to me, mm -hmm. but uh, especially when you're talking about the, the Japanese art, the kintsugi. Kintsugi. Okay, I'll, I'll, I'll stand back here. here. We're, we're, we're going to be we're competing, here. yeah. <laughs> but um, oftentimes, you know, I, I, with my patients, they'll oftentimes come in, have injuries, sometimes we can get them better, sometimes they're left with permanent problems, and I just love that visualization of sometimes these can actually add value to you as a person, add value to your, to your life, instead of just looking at it as I'm a broken pot, maybe you can turn this into a positive thing, I love that visualization. I, I can't, I couldn't agree more, uh, I may have told you this, but I have just passed the seven-year mark of cancer survivorship. I was diagnosed in 2014, and I'm fine. Thank you. Thank you. That's not why I tell you. I tell you because nobody has more physical scars than I do. I had seven operations. I had 16 sessions of chemotherapy. I had rounds of radiation. I'm covered in scars, and after learning about kintsugi, that's my kintsugi. All those keloids and cuts, and <laughs> it's who I am. And when they offered plas plastic surgery to straighten it out, I said to the doctor, why? <laughs> so anyway, yeah, Kintsugi is, is valuable, and it provided a new lens for me to see my own healing. Any other questions? Ah, here's one. Sure. Thank you for coming. We appreciate that. Uh, welcome. Two questions. One, yes. what if, for you, for example, going to other organizations and teaching them how to see, um, how long is a session with you typically? And then the other question, that yes. answer, I, I'm just, I need to know the name of the painting of the two figures with the chicken. Oh, it's a Grant Wood. <laughs> it's by Grant Wood. Yep, yep. I'll give you the exact citation and where it is. But it's by the guy who did American Gothic, you know, with the fork, the same artist. Very American in its own way. Um, so to answer your question about duration of sessions, I really defer to my clients what kind of training. I usually have a meeting with them about what issues they have, what difficulties they're having, what they hope to get out of the session. For example, when I work with special operations teams, I have them in a museum. We go on a day that it's closed because they can't be identified, and I have them for six hours. I don't know who's more exhausted at the end of that day, me or them. Uh, a standard training session, medical, when I do grand rounds, is anywhere from an hour to two hours, but the standard sweet spot when I do an uh, in-person delivery is three hours. It goes as fast. I hope this went as fast for you as it did for me. It went, you know, the three hours goes very quickly. We have an opportunity to dive in. So I really defer to the client, but the uh, duration is really very flexible. 
I have all day in London on Monday with the client, all day. I'm very excited about that. So, um, yeah, it, because you know what? There's, there's no dearth of issues here. I, I have a huge archive of works of art, and we always have lots and lots of issues to discuss. Any other questions? There's one. I'm curious, you've worked with different groups, uh, military and SEALs and doctors and mm -hmm. financial people. I'm just curious if you can kind of summarize the differences between those groups. Um, pros and cons, what do you think about the doctor group and right. how are they different than other groups? I can start with an overarching observation because medical students and working in medicine was my very first group and I'm indebted to them for taking a chance on me. Doctors don't like to be wrong <laughs> about anything. And you know, in my first couple of groups, after I started training the medical students, we started bringing in doctors from the hospital and we started bringing in specialties. And you know, I, I really had to contain myself because they would start to talk about the artist and Tiepolo and the role in the Renaissance and I'd have to say, you know what, that's not the point here. The point is not to show our knowledge of who the painter is, but it's talking about what we see. And that's not always so easy. And I've had a couple of colleagues and mentors that want me to mix classes. They think that would be very valuable to have some cops in with some doctors or to have some you know, homicide detectives in with some banking vice presidents. I'm not convinced because, I mean, I know it's multiple perspectives, but I find, this is not gonna be a surprise to anybody, that genders see things differently. Um, I'm, I'm making an overarching, I'm making a, a generalization, but based on my experience, that women tend to be more attuned to detail. But men, again, overarching, are very good at getting the big picture. And so, you know, depending on professions, when I'm with people in law enforcement, it's always, where are we right now? Their situational awareness is so keen at all times. I always joke with them, it's about real estate. They always know exactly where they are. So, uh, yes, the groups definitely differ. Um, but what I try to keep constant with all the groups is we're going in at ground zero on knowledge of art. There is no knowledge of art that's needed for this program, and in fact, I prefer not to have it because I don't care if it's Monet or Manet. That's up to me to decide what we look at. It's about the substance of the data. It's not who did it. So, so yes, the whole reason I wrote my first book was I was getting all these responses of how people were using art from across the professional spectrum, and I thought, we need to share this. So it's a good question. Any others? Anything? Well, if you're too shy, I'll be at the table in the back if you'd like to ask me, so. I, w I was just going to say that um, I, I remember back in medical school in Cleveland that we were talking about this at our table. I, I think I did a, a course in the museum, the Cleveland Museum of Art, mm -hmm. that was very similar to this. So you might have uh, had an influence on me even, uh, <laughs> even back then. So. It's very nice to know <laughs> they have, but you know, Yale was really the start, and then the Frick came in, and they've been all popping up all over the country. I've started some of them. I've worked with doctors, and you know, in that program, I don't feel proprietary about the medical aspects because the more humanities, the better. Who am I going to stop people from seeing? Um, I don't have an issue with that, and it really warms my heart when I hear that there are medical, you know, medical humanities programs looking at art around the country. So, well, thank you very much. Thank Amy. you again. Let's give her a round of applause. Thank you.